Well, if you have your Bibles um, and your worksheet, you can turn to chapter 5 of Romans, verse 12. Chapter 5, verse 12 of Romans. And as I mentioned last week, I'm, and I'm going to skip a lot of the intro just for time's sake because I really want to finish this packet before we leave for vacation. We don't need this to go on for over a month on a single verse. So um, I've included the entire passage that we will be looking at, but the, the handout focuses simply on verse 12. Uh, but let's go ahead and read this. Brian, will you read 12 to 21 for me and ignore the sound of the ice cold code zero? <laughs> Yeah, okay, good. All right. Uh, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world uh, before the law was given, but sin is, uh, is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to, who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many die through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. <clears throat> and the free gift is not like the result of, the, of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespasses, uh, uh, one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation of, for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many more were, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded, all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Brian. And so as, um, as we look again, we'll finish up verse 12 today. Just a reminder that this passage is extremely difficult. Okay, um, I, share, I shared with you before what MacArthur says. When a guy like John MacArthur approaches this passage and says, Yee, this one's tough. That gives me pause to think, okay? Um, Schreiner also, Moo also, the three commentaries I'm using in particular. Um, Morris said this, um, said that the argument is very condensed in this, and in all translations and comments, we must allow for the possibility that Paul's meaning may at some point be other than we think. Okay, so... In other words, we need, to, we need to kind of approach this passage with a little bit of an open hand, which is all I can do right now. So, you say hit the word you might. Uh, I'll, I'll give it to you in just a second. Okay. Um, this isn't in your notes anyway, this part. So, um, But as, as Morris continues to say, the main argument is still clear in this. So it's one of those things that when we pull out, it's pretty obvious what, what Paul is saying here in chapter 5 of Romans. When we dig in, uh, it gets a little more complex, but we can't lose the simplicity of the argument as well, right? Sin came through Adam, that's one realm. Uh, salvation came through Christ for those that believe, that's the other realm. And so um, that's the dichotomy that, that Paul is drawing here. So even though it's pretty in-depth, um, we can't lose the simplicity of that. The second thing that I would remind you is because of the difficulty of this, we have to be cautious because we have a tendency to approach things first with our system, our systematic theology. We say, this is what we believe, now what does the text tell me? As opposed to saying, what does the text tell us? Okay, And so hermeneutically, that's very, very important as we approach 
this passage. And so we are on, I think it's Roman numeral six in your outline. Thank you. Uh, and at least in my outline, uh, we are, uh, you'll see where it says sin is singular throughout this section. Uh, I have it as that. Oh, that's number, number two. Number two, uh, yeah. Under, under six, yes. No, under four. Yeah, six, six, <laughs> Roman numeral four, two. Okay, so now um, you'll remember there's a lot, like you, the very first word, therefore. We have a page of notes on that we went through last week. Because what does the therefore refer back to? Um, we talked about that. I'm not going to rehash that. You're welcome to go back to the notes. Um, and then we talked about the just as comparison that Paul starts in verse 12 that he never completes in verse 12, which is obviously troublesome, right? Paul saying just as this is this, you would then expect him to say, then this is this. And he does not do that in verse 12. He does not do it again until... Um, verses verse 18 and 19 is when he completes that um, and so it starts to make the interpretation a little more difficult okay well we talked about that we're not going to rehash that so a couple of things here um, again we talked about Adam um, that's where we left off last week if I remember correctly uh, Adam was created in God's image, right? The Imago Dei. I've gone back just a little bit as we set up today's discussion. But you can stay on number two there. Um, and so, sin, as we look at this, so we have Adam, right? God created Adam, Imago Dei in his image, subdued the earth. Uh, and sin enters through Adam, as we know. And we talked about... Um, Many today, theologically, are suggesting that Adam is representative, not created first man. Here's what I'll tell you. Uh, Paul clearly believes Adam was created by God, that Adam was the first man. Uh, you, you really struggle to build a theistic evolution argument around this passage and other passages, obviously. But uh, it's very, very important to our faith that we have an understanding that sin came in through Adam. Right? Because with sin comes what? Death. And so you have no room for an evolutionary process prior to Adam. So that's a really, really important point. Um, and, and it's... You know, I, I think I've mentioned to you before, uh, Tim Keller, who I appreciate, um, Tim Keller wrote a white paper on um, Genesis 1 and 2. And his suggestion was that the Hebrew is such that you don't have to hold to a literal six-day creation. That there is room for a much longer process and that there's room for evolution. That Paul's intent... This is important. Paul's intent in Genesis 1 and 2, I'm sorry, Moses' intent in the Pentateuch and in Genesis 1 and 2 is not to say, here is your scientific manual for how I created the earth, but rather to, to say God created the earth. Uh, people smarter than me, and I, as I told you before a couple of weeks ago, uh, I don't... I have not dived into this. I don't have time to dive into this uh, right now, but someday I will. Maybe when I'm dead, I don't know. But uh, there, there is this, this thought that in Genesis 1 and 2, that Moses is actually giving a point-by-point -point dismantling of the Egyptian gods. You think that this Egyptian god did this? No, God did this. Okay? That's all cool. That all may be true. I, don't, I guess I don't have a problem with it. Um, but the fall of Adam is pivotal in our faith. It is pivotal. And so we could talk about, you know, did the generations that we see detailed in early Genesis, do those are those like a single generation really? Or are they, you know, these extended? Yeah, okay, cool. We can do all of that, but theologically, the fall of Adam is really important, okay? And it's important for our understanding 
of the work of Christ on the cross on our behalf. So, I approach Genesis 1 and 2. I'm a young earth, six day, literal six-day creationist. Okay, that's what I am. Having said that, um, the church has gone to the mat over that issue in this country instead of over the cross of Christ. And so where I stand on it is that I'm very, very open-handed. If you want to believe that the earth is 12,000 years old or a million years old or this happened, I don't actually care at all. God's creation of Adam, Adam's first sin, the, the spread of original sin to all of mankind, the sickness that that creates in our hearts, uh, and the need for a Savior. That, um, that salvation is obtained through faith. Like those things are what matter. Um, uh, Genesis 1 and 2 does not matter significantly to me in terms of am I willing to go to the mat over it. In other words, I think you can hold orthodox views and have different beliefs about the age of the earth. You cannot be orthodox at all uh, and ignore original sin. Period. Okay, so, uh, and that's what we want to talk about today. Um, and so you're, you're in the notes here, number two, sin is singular throughout this section. And you'll note, uh, when we say singular, I mean it, it is actually sin, not sins. Up. It's not a plural word, it is a singular word here. Okay, throughout this entire section, when Paul says sin, he's talking about a condition rather than an individual act. Okay, a condition rather than an individual act. And we know, of course, that sin enters through Adam. I'm going to reread this passage because I think it becomes important um, in a few moments here. Okay, Genesis 3, verses 4 to 6. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, the fruit, of course, of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was a delight for the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So I think this is key later because um, Mu will make the argument that in chapter 5, verse 12, that we see a chiasm. Okay? A, B, B, A. We'll go through that again in a second. Um, but Adam sinned. He died. All died because all sinned. That that is a Hebrew chiasm. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Hermen hermeneutically, this is where um, Mu and others will suggest that we get into trouble. They will suggest that uh, when we look at the all sin part, they want to make the jump that that's original sin because we approach the text with other texts in mind, which we always should. Uh, we approach the text with our systematic theologies. And so when we do that, we then read into Romans 5 verse 12 something that does not exist in Romans 5 verse 12. And I'll deal with that in just a minute. But um, I would argue, I think Moo's correct, when the all sinned in 5 verse 12 is referring to your sins. Okay? And I would argue not in the fact that... Um, we'll talk about this. We will, I promise. Um, but I would argue that that all sinned, it, the, the sin there is rebellion. See, I would define sin as rebellion against God. It is you trying to be God. It is me trying to play God. It's what Adam and Eve did, right? That was ultimately Eve's sin. Eve's sin, and then, of course, Adam, who had dominion. He was in charge, right? So being a leader, that is placed upon you. Um I would argue that Eve's sin is a sin of rebellion. It is a sin of trying to make herself God. Okay? That's really, really important for us to understand as we move forward. And we'll come to why that is here. Before we do, I want to talk about the doctrine of original sin. I in no way, this is really important, in no way am I suggesting that original sin is not a thing. Okay? 
The Bible clearly teaches the concept of original sin as passed on from Adam. Again, we're, this is kind of a, a, a fine point, right? It's, it's, a, uh, it's an argument that matters when we um, look at this text, but we need to remember that Paul himself argues for original sin. In fact, he'll talk about it through the rest of this section. But in chapter 5, verse 12, as we, uh, as we interpret that verse, it is important that we don't read into that something that does not exist there. Okay, so um, let me just quickly run through some original sin passages for you. Genesis 8, 21, uh, part B of that verse. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Okay, original sin. We are born with a sin nature. Condition of all humanity. Psalm chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. No doubt there about our sin, about our sin nature. Psalm 51, 5. David says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Again, original sin. Ecclesiastics, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 3, part C. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Of course, Paul in Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And again in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21, for as, by, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And then of course Ephesians 2, which we've talked a lot about in this class, and you were dead in what? Your trespasses, your sins. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The Bible clearly teaches original sin. It clearly teaches that that original sin has been passed throughout humanity, uh, and that we are responsible for that sin even before birth. So, again, I want to be very clear. I am in no way trying to weaken a doctrine of original sin. I am in no way trying to weaken the doctrine of total depravity. What I'm saying is chapter 5, verse 12 doesn't, doesn't really hit that. Okay, it kind of does so obliquely. All right. Now, a quick point on Eve. As I said, we'll come to that. Interestingly, people have said, well, wait a minute. Who had the original sin? Was it Adam or Eve? Well, originally, who was it? Sam. It was well, talking about humanity, yes. yes. Um, but originally, the this, this sin was Eve, not Adam. Okay? I think that's important. Paul clearly knows that, right? Um, obviously, Paul knew Genesis well. But 2 Corinthians 11, 3. But I, am a, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion in Christ. Paul knows this. In fact, in 1 Timothy 2.14, he wrote, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So he clearly knows that, that Eve was technically the first sin of humanity. Okay? By the way, anyone see um, uh, the, oh, what's his name, Rick Warren's letter this week? No. So Rick Warren's uh, church... In uh, Saddleback Community in California, um, Saddleback was um, ejected from the SBC because he ordained women pastors. Um, 
pretty hot topic right now. There are actually several churches in the SBC. It'll be interesting to see if they follow through with the others. Um, but uh, he just wrote this letter saying, ladies, forgive me for my preaching in the past that, that the pastoral role was for men. I mean, he cites a bunch of uh, research that he did without actually citing the research. I read hundreds of commentaries, and I am now convinced. But he never says why in any of it. You know why he doesn't say why? Because you can't. That's why. Um, this idea that this Timothy passages, and this is a little dramatic aside for a moment, but this Timothy passage... Paul is making the argument going back to Adam and Eve. In other words, he's saying this is not cultural. This is humanity. Okay, this is, and I would actually argue that this is pretty important. You see, Adam was given dominion. Eve's role was to be the helpmate to Adam. And listen to what Carol suggests. He says, though Eve sinned, sin passed through Adam. As such, Eve would have been punished for her sin. So imagine, if you will, for a moment, if Eve had sinned and Adam had not, what would have happened? Well, Eve would have been punished. Right? But she was not the head of humanity. The head of humanity, biblically, is Adam. Right? He was given dominion. That's what the word dominion means. So it is when the leader, the head of humanity sinned, that sin brought death to all humanity. Okay? That's an important point. Uh, Carol continues, But Adam was the head of the human race, and so sin passed through him, not Eve. Indeed, salvation is, is connected to the woman in Genesis 3. Right? In, in this early prophecy of Jesus Christ that we read in Genesis 3, Salvation is connected through the woman. That's true. Why was Mary a virgin? Where does sin flow through? Through the male. Okay? Um, so I think that's an important point. As we, Even as we go to interpret other things, like, of course, 1 Timothy 2. Okay. And death through sin. i got to get rolling. Holy cow. Um. Oh, brother. Sorry, Chad. And death through sin. So, uh, again, it's important to understand that Paul's audience, the Jewish people, believed that death came along with sin. That was never a question for them. And so as Paul is saying this, it's important that we understand this is just understood by his audience, by the Jewish audience to which he was writing. Now, the question then becomes which death? Are we talking physical death? Or are we talking spiritual death? Uh, in verse 14, chapter 5, verse 14, the death is clearly physical. But in verse 21, death is a contrast, uh, or is contrasted with eternal life. So we see both physical and spiritual here. Uh, verse 16 and 18, death is condemnation. So how should we read it in verse 12? I think it's pretty clear to me that Paul is talking about both physical and spiritual death. By the way, if you wanted to uh, um, do this for a living, there are essays written, um, like you know, published journal articles about Paul and spiritual death versus physical death. Is it are they separate? Are they together? How does that? How do we? How do we parse that in Pauline literature? Okay. Clearly, to me, Paul's talking about physical and spiritual death here. Um, but, there you go. Um, and you see that, uh, I think I kept that in your notes. Pauline bi biographers and commentators suggest he cites death as a physico-spiritual entity. Right? Because Christians die. Mm -hmm. So there's a physical element to death. We just don't have eternal death. So, you see my notes there, I think. Well, I appreciate that I put that in there. Well, I appreciate the debate. Yeah, yeah, that's great. But again, sometimes we get, I think, caught up in the weeds, right? Paul's talking clearly, in my mind, about both. And so, death spreads to all men. Well, what does that mean? 
Um, the, the Greek verb refers to the idea of in this way, but what does that actually refer to? Uh, is Adam responsible for all death spreading? Or should we read it as in these circumstances, which is another way to interpret that phrase, um, that death spread? In these circumstances that death spread. Those, uh, right here, these focus on the corporate significance of Adam's sin. In other words, Adam's sin, did that spread death to all of humanity? But if this is a chiasm, so commentators debate that, but if this is a chiasm, and you'll remember, and I'll just quickly, you guys know the, the old phrase, right? If the going gets tough, that's a chiasm. A, B, B, A. If the going gets tough, the tough gets going. A, B, B, A. This actually reads a lot like a Hebrew chiasm. Okay? If this is a chiasm, then we have to change our understanding. And I suggest to you that it probably is. And so if this is a chiasm, Paul draws a comparison between how death came into the world through sin and how death now spreads to everyone through sin. Sin produces death. All die because all sin. Important. You'll remember we talked last week, this idea that we have to read this differently if we, if we want to read into this the, the doctrine of original sin. That's all. Later we'll see that in the passage. But we have to read this comparison differently, and it matters. Okay? It matters. So let's talk about this. Because all sinned. So, sin produces death, all die because all sinned. Death then is universal because sin is universal. And so just a brief moment, a very brief moment here. I want to talk quickly about this idea. So what is Paul saying here? What's the relationship between Adam's sin and ours? Why do all people sin? I want to talk about soteriology for a minute. There are two main ideas within soteriology. One is what we call synergistic theology or soteriology. <laughs> Synergistic soteriology. Soteriology is the doctrine of what? Salvation. Salvation. Synergistic soteriology says that it's man and God, right? Synergy. Okay? Real quick, three synergistic views um, throughout history that I want you to know. So the first was a heresy called Pelagianism. In Pelagianism, uh, Pelagius in the 4th century, I think, he was countered by Augustine, so it must have been earlier. But Pelagian said this, Men have free will, and therefore are untainted by Adam's sin, and they can choose good or evil. So you are born morally neutral according to this heresy. You can choose to be holy as I am holy, as God commands, apart from your faith in Christ. That is clearly not biblical. Okay? Uh, it denies the doctrine of original sin, the doctrine of total depravity, and again, oh, I have the date here, it is 431, so it's the 5th century. Um, so Augustine opposed this. Well, so the church came together, Pelagian, uh, the Pelagian heresy was smashed, in theory, Pelagius was kicked out. A little while later, we get this thing called semi-Pelagianism. Okay? Trying to move it more appropriate. Men can't choose good or evil, but men can at least choose to move towards God, and then God responds to you. Question, who's God there? Men. Yeah. See, the, the heresy of Pelagianism goes back to the Adamic heresy from the beginning. Right? It's rebellion. It is us saying that we are God. That's what it refers back to. So man is, in this theory, depraved, kind of. Okay, that's why we call it kind of Pelagianism, or semi-Pelagianism. That was condemned by the church in 8529. After the Reformation, we have another type of synergistic soteriology called Arminianism. Okay, this is Arminianism. Arminianism. 
They say that man is totally depraved, but God shares provenient grace with all people so that they can then choose to be saved if they want to be. So God puts you in kind of this situation now um, for a short period of time where you get to choose God or not choose God. Okay? Now, I do want to stress this. Really uncritical. Uh, I would argue, I uh, should be careful. Some of my um, Calvinist brethren want to paint Arminianism as Pelagianism. It is not. Let me be very clear about that. Arminianism is not Pelagianism. It's not semi-Pelagianism, right? Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism both say that you are doing the choosing apart from God. Arminianism says God bathes you in a certain amount of grace that allows you to now choose God. So the initial focus is a work of God. Now, I want to be clear... It's wrong. I'm, for those of you that are Arminian, I apologize deeply, except for I don't. <laughs> Scripture is very clear that that is not the case. Ephesians 2, verse 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. I wish my daughter were here, right? Dead means dead. D-E-D. -E -D. Dead. <laughs> those of you who don't get the joke, that's my daughter loves that. But anyway. Okay, so I, I just want to be clear, though, that Arminianism is not Pelagianism. Arminianism is within the realm of orthodoxy. It's wrong, and I think other parts of Arminianism can lead to really bad heresies. Okay? But Arminianism, as it refers to the soteriology question, is within the bounds of orthodoxy. Okay? I would not say that our friends at the Wesleyan Church are heretics. I would say they're wrong as they understand this idea of grace. Okay? They, by the way, are trying to deal with the same thing that Calvinists struggle with. I mean, ultimately. Well, what about the guy that said they were saved and came to church and was super involved and then fell away? I mean, that's really where Arminianism gets its traction with people. Well, what do you do there? Well, Arminians say you just got to get resaved. Clearly, that's not scriptural. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So, Arminianism is wrong. There's not a doubt in my mind about Arminianism being wrong. We are elected before the cornerstone of the world was laid. Like, the Bible's clear about that. Paul cannot be more clear about that. But, again, it is within the realm of orthodoxy. I do not suggest that we should be saying that, you know, these people are heretics for believing that. I think that's really, really important. So we have Arminianism. It was refuted by the Synod of Dort. We don't like to talk about that today, because in today's circles, we've fallen into this... Oh, we've... <laughs> that hurts. I shouldn't do that. Um, so we've fallen into these two kind of camps, right? Calvinism and Arminianism. And, and so because we've fallen into these camps, uh, we have some struggles these days. But I, I think it's important for us to remember that the church came together and refuted Arminianism just like it came together and refuted Pelagianism. Just like it came together and... Uh, refuted the Arian heresies. Right? The Synod of Dort was the church coming together and saying, these guys are wrong. These guys, by the way, were called the Remonstrants. They're wrong. This is not what the Bible teaches. And yet it's moved back into our culture. In fact, I would argue it's what drives a poor ecclesiology in the church today. Right? Ecclesiology is the study of the church. Like this idea, I mean, if Arminianism is true, we should be handing out iPads to every new visitor that comes. Maybe a Harley. That seems to be kind of in today. Let's give them all a Harley. And then they'll go, hey, this is really cool. I like Jesus. I'll say my little prayer and call it good. That's not scriptural salvation at all. But 
A poor soteriology drives a poor, really poor, ecclesiology, and that gets us into trouble. So I think it's really important that we stand fast, but I would not go so far as to say it, it is a heresy. Okay. So many suggest here that this sin refers, when he says, in, and all sin, refers to the individual sins committed by individuals. Like we see in Romans 3.23. You asked about the tense of the verb, right? The aorist, um, active, um, I have it here in my notes. Um, I think I have it in my notes. I don't know, you could look it up on Logos. Aorist, active, indicative, third person, plural. Yeah. So, that, by the way, is what we see in Romans 3.23. For all what? Have sin. Have sin and fall short of the glory of God. It's the exact same tense. Okay? Um, <coughs> and this is the idea, then, that every person dies because every person sins. By the way, to a degree... We have to be careful not to fall in the ditch of saying that there's no original sin, right? That's where Pelagian, the Pelagian heresy comes from. This idea that there is no original sin, therefore each individual alone sins. But we see in verse 18a, which is the conclusion, right? Remember, verse 12 starts a just as comparison that Paul doesn't complete. Verse 18, Paul completes it, and here's what he says. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. So we know that there is that connection of original sin later in this text. Yes? Okay. Uh, some say we should live in the unresolved tension here. Paul does not really resolve the dilemma in any specific way. So we are wrong to force an understanding on the text. And here's what Moose says. I want you to hear this. Huh. All right, so Moose says, a systematic theologian may have to find a resolution, but we exegetes need not insist that Paul in this text assumes of teaching one. Now, it is certainly the case that we can err by insisting that a text gives us answers to all, all our questions about a topic, uh, still worse by foisting on a biblical author not good <laughs> by a biblical author uh, where am I theological categories that do not fit that author's teaching but we can also fail to do our job as exegetes by failing to pursue reasonable harmonizations that the author may assume or intend okay so there's that some create a bridge between Adam's sin and the condemnation of all these commentators suggest a corrupt human nature was passed on to all humanity. Death is caused by each individual's sin, but is tied to Adam's sin because it is corrupted human nature. And again, there's merit to this. Verse 12, sin is individual. Verse 18, it's corp death is corporate. And so this would explain the fallen nature of humanity. Many theologians assume the necessity of such a view. The problem is Paul doesn't say that. So as much as we want to read it in, Paul doesn't say it. And so we're left trying to figure that out. It adds a middle step of a passed on corrupt nature that Paul doesn't say. In each point, now this is really key, in each Pauline point, where Adam's sin leads to corporate death, the relationship is explicitly stated. So everywhere after this, it is explicitly stated. Verse 15, many died through one man's trespass. Verse 16, the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. Verse 17, because of one man's trespass, death reigned. Verse 18, one trespass led to condemnation for all men. So every time after this, Paul explicitly, very clearly links the two. But he doesn't here. If we're going to add it here, here's what we would have to say. One man's trespass, adding in this phrase, resulted in the corruption of human nature, which caused all people to sin. And sin brought condemnation on all. 
That's not what it says. And so we're forced then to take a look at that. Moo says, while it is possible that Paul would want us to assume these additions, he's given us little basis to do so. So that means we better be cautious. Yes? And again, Paul later teaches these concepts. So we're not out of bounds for suggesting that. But here's what Moose says, and we'll end with this. Moose suggests that we should read verse 12 in light of 18 and 19, since they are joined by these comparison clauses. All sin must be corporate. In the idea of sinning in and with Adam. All sin is in some way identical to how Adam sinned. I would argue completely. When you sin, you're doing exactly what Adam sinned. What Adam did when he sinned. Isn't that true? If you say, no God, you're not right. I want to do what I want to do here, which is really what sin is. You're rebelling against God. So your sin is identical in its, uh, in its root. The sin of Adam is the sin of all. So there's no issue with Paul saying all die because all sin and all died because Adam sinned. But there is a sense of corporate solidarity that we read about in the Old Testament world. Right? We see that with Achan's sin. So while carefully interpreting the text, we must not lose sight of the simple. Adam's sin led to physical and spiritual death. We are responsible in the same way of, uh, as descendants of Adam who sinned. So I think it's important. When Paul said... Um, Adam sinned, Adam died, <coughs> all died because all sinned. I think it's important we don't read into that. It doesn't weaken the doctrine of original sin. In fact, later it talks about original sin. But we cannot read into something that Paul doesn't write. It very simply could simply be Paul saying in a chiastic form, Paul, uh, Adam sinned, and he died. You sin, and you die. Your sin is connected with Adam's sin, right? It has been passed on, but you are responsible for your sin, and your sin is the same sin as Adam's sin, that it is rebellion. Okay? We are short on time, but do we have... Any quick questions? I will skip my last stuff and we'll hit it later. I probably should read to you this quote from MacArthur on this passage. MacArthur says, Paul does not attempt to make his explanation wholly understandable to his readers. So thanks, John. Appreciate that. And he himself did not claim to have full comprehension. Did you hear that? He himself did not claim to have full comprehension. Uh, hold on, i got to find where I'm at. Of the significance of what the Lord revealed to and through him. He simply declared that Adam's sin was transmitted to all his posterity because that truth was revealed to him by God. So we can't lose sight of the, of the big picture even as we get into the weeds on this. Okay? okay. Alright. We didn't get through all of my notes. Uh, maybe we'll hit the other later. Let me pray for us.